another mentor of mine always says is that a lot of companies that you know that that are successful stop doing the things that got them where they are so for me my number one thing is to make sure that i stay true to the foundation that my dad's built and make sure that customers are are have awareness of all the different things that we do and make sure that we're staying relevant for the next 35 years Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan, where we interview ordinary Michiganders doing some pretty extraordinary things. I'm your host, Cliff Duvinois. So Michigan over the years has been changing, and I knew at some point in time I was going to be talking to somebody running a technology company here in Michigan. If you've been paying attention to the news, uh, you will see that uh, you know our governor, our legislator, is working really hard to try to bring more tech business into Michigan. And I'm happy today because we actually have a company that was actually founded in Michigan that is doing some pretty amazing things uh, over the last 35 plus years that they've been in business in the IT space. With that being said, today we are joined by Casey Lowry, President of Applied Innovation out of Grand Rapids. Casey, how are you? I'm doing great, Cliff. I really appreciate you having me on the show and uh, just excited to spend some time with you today. Awesome. Let's talk about your story. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? So born and raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, Moved around a little bit, but I'm uh, probably about a mile from where I grew up. So really close to Burton and Breton here in in Grand Rapids. Like I said, born and raised, went to high school downtown. And then uh, after I graduated from high school, uh, moved moved away for school. Nice. Where'd you go to school? I went to Indiana University. Okay. Kelly School of Business. So um, moved down there is about six hours away at the time. Now there's faster ways to get there than there used to be, but, uh, yeah, wanted to get away, but knew I wanted to, um, go to business school. So, and you said you went to the Kelly business school. Correct. Why did you decide to go there? So, you know, at the time, I I think for me, it was a lot about kind of getting away, getting away from Grand Rapids and kind of seeing what I was made of. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew that was a good school and I knew I wanted to go to a big school. So, I think those couple of things, and uh, when I went and visited, I just fell in love with the campus. Now, what did you get your degree in? So I was uh, business. I was operations um, and marketing. Now, your father started Applied Innovations when? Correct. Yeah, it was uh, April Fool's Day of 1987. Yep. Nice. Now, the company was going in full swing. At some point after you graduated from college, did you come and join your father's company at the time, or did you go off and get some experience someplace else? Yeah, so after I graduated from IU, uh, I decided that I wanted to get some sales experience. I felt like I, you know, my goal even when I went to IU was to hopefully someday end up in the family business, but um, you know, I, I knew I wanted to go out and get some additional experience. So I actually went to work for uh, Rico. Uh, direct operation out of the Detroit area and did that for uh, did that for two years and then at the time my wife uh, we weren't married at the time but my wife was looking to um, to go to nursing school and she transferred to Grand Valley and felt like if we were going to move back to Grand Rapids uh, that it would be a great time to hopefully join the business and and see if I could help grow it. Now your father John Correct. Yep. Started Applied Innovation in uh, 87. Yep. So the question I got is, is why technology? Why get into that space in the first place? Entrepreneur, entrepreneurs in general, I think they kind of start businesses for a few reasons. One is, you know, often they're high in control. I'd say that he's pretty high in control. And, um, you know, if you go back, you know, the story that he always tells me is that, uh, he watched my grandpa lose his job after he had been someplace for 33 years. Ouch. And so I think for him, it was a sense of security and really being able to kind of control his own destiny. So the reason I think that he ended up in the technology space, I guess, believe it or not, tech, yeah, facsimile back in the day in the 80s was technology. So um, that was a space that he knew. He had worked for a place um, that ended up becoming a competitor. Uh, but that kind of goes back to uh, really around the time when he left the, uh, brass business, which is where my grandpa was in. So certainly, yep. So, uh, that was a, you know, late seventies that he got into that space and, uh, always, like I said, knew that he wanted to have some control and be able to do something of his own. So now your location, you started off at with one location. Now you're up to 11. 
think 14. 14. Yep. Okay. I can count, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so you're I, should, to... I should know that, I feel like, <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> okay, so you're up to 14 locations. So first off, that's incredible. That really is. The second off, my question to you is, is that when you came back to the company, how many locations were you up to at that point? I believe we had one sales rep in Lansing. Uh, we had a Kalamazoo location, and then we had a sales office in Muskegon. So it was really three, I, I say, but potentially four. You could call it four. Uh, right. We had one, like I said, one sales rep um, out of the Lansing area. So. so you started off with, you had one location, you had a couple of small satellite offices, and then you come along and join the company. But now here we are, you're at 14 locations, you're across multiple states, right? You got Michigan, you got Indiana, you've got Florida. The only word that comes to mind is explosive growth, right? You guys are growing rapidly. What, what do you attribute that growth to? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and I think when you look at it, so I started in 2006 and a lot of the growth has been, um, you know, has been since then. But I, I think oftentimes people don't look at the kind of the foundation of the things that were built uh, kind of leading up to some of that explosive growth. So I think that was kind of always at our core. Actually, if you look back, my uh, there's an article in my dad's office. And in 1997, he said, I think we could be $100 million in sales and uh, 17 offices across Man, the state. Man, I love bodacious so, goals. So I think you <laughs> you know, you know kind of throw that out there. And I, I feel like even when I started, $100 million was kind of always our goal. And I, I don't know if I even truly believed it, but then you hear it enough times and you kind of feel like, you know, everybody starts to buy in. So, um, so and I think, you know, we got, we got lucky along the way. We had right things happen in the industry. Um, I think oftentimes, too, one of the things that's attractive about us, um, so we, we've done a, quite a few acquisitions over the years. And I think one thing that, uh, you know, that, other people like my dad who are maybe looking to sell their business and don't have an exit plan, a lot of times we're a great option for them because they know that we care about their people and we're going to continue to deliver sure. great service and we're going to take care of their customers. So I think when you put a few of the acquisitions together and then you look at some of our strategies for organic growth, I just think it's kind of been a perfect storm. You made the comment about how you joined the company in 2006, 2008. You know, the economy is melting down. You know, we're too big to fail and yep. you know everybody's in panic and basically the whole country froze what has kind of surprised you the most about getting through those really tough times you know i guess when we look at like 2008 2009 specifically um i remember we did um i think it was 19 million in sales and we did it the same the next year and we felt like staying flat was growth kind of in the great recession um we did do one acquisition that i feel like was super key back then that really kind of helped, I feel like, catapult us over that $20 million. And we always kind of felt like there was these hurdles that you had to get past. Um, and that's something that we've talked about over the years. But, uh, you know, I think specifically, again, looking at that one, um, I remember one thing that we did back at that time. Because in 2006, I came on, and I was a sales rep, and I would go knock on doors. And um, I still remember people not knowing who Applied Innovation was. And at the time, we were Applied Imaging. So I would go out, and I would cold call, and I would um, – you know, I'd talk about applied and everything we had to offer. And I had to, you know, teach people who applied even was. And, you know, you just get a little bit of momentum with acquisition. And and I, I wouldn't say the rest is history, but that really helped catapult us through that time. Tell us about some of the things that really surprised you when you joined the business. Well, I would say we're, uh, as I mentioned, very entrepreneurial. So I would say we shoot from the hip a little bit. So, <laughs> you know, I came from uh, from Rico Direct, and it was very structured. Like, I knew exactly what my territory was. I knew exactly what my quota was. I knew all of these things. Um, and when I came on board here, I was given a territory that someone else shared, and I would go cold call, and um, I had to come back, and I would try to put it in our CRM. And I'm like, I actually can't call on that account. So for me, it was the lack of organization made it very difficult for me. Certainly. Um, although, you know, I think in a lot of ways, uh, being able to shoot from the hip and being able to be flexible is also the a reason that we've been able to be so successful because we can react quickly to customer requests and, and really take care of people the way they need to be taken care of. Um, but yeah, certainly the, the lack of some of that structure. And, you know, even today when we look at it, we want to add, um, add as we want to add structure to make sure that we can sustain and we can continue to grow. But at the same time, we want to make sure that there's not too much red tape. It's certainly a balance. So It definitely is. One of the things I know, it seems like 
it seems like the people that start a business are not the same people that grow the business. Uh, what would what would be some of the things maybe that he was thinking of along the way as far as managing that growth goes? That was like, okay, maybe this worked when we were a startup, but it's not working today. I moved back from Detroit in 2006. We had about 65 people. Uh, it was sometime in between, um, you, you know, 2009, that's when the Great Recession hit. We, again, we're just trying to kind of stay flat. It was about 2011, because I had been saying to my dad, you know, it'd be great if we could go over to Detroit. You know, we've got some great customers that, that have locations over there that were having someone else service for us. Um, and I think when we added that, so looking at new geographies for us has always been a way to really kind of ignite some growth. So we went from being very small in, in, uh, in Detroit to being able to now having multiple teams um, and all the way up to kind of the Saginaw, the Clio area is where our closest office is up there. Um, but for us, it's been kind of adding those locations. And I think as tough as it is for my dad to let go of some of that, um, you know, some of the control, I think he has done a pretty good job for an entrepreneur of being able to let people kind of go and do what they need to do and kind of move into more of an organizational um, stage company. So certainly. And I would say, too, you know, even when we, uh, you know, when we started to grow for us, a big part of it was the culture. So we felt like we wanted to, you know, you know that each office is going to have a little bit of its own subculture, but we wanted to ha kind of have that that foundation really at the core of everything that we do. And so I think by by being, you know, back in 2011, I don't think culture was as popular as it, back then as it is to talk about now, but kind of having some of that foresight to, to make sure that we kind of codify who we are um, so that way people know what they're getting into when they come on board. So I spent some time on your LinkedIn page, and I see Casino Night. Yep. You know, a lot of employees rolling dice, and I saw knights fighting in armor. Is this all part of your culture? Yes, for, for sure. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's one of those things that really – I feel like when people come on board, they kind of latch onto um, and they kind of make it their own. So, you know, I, we always say at the t uh, from his perspective, he's kind of always setting the, the values and the vision. But really, when it comes down to how we um, how that kind of gets implemented, it may not be 100 percent him. So uh, but but the casino night was something that he always envisioned. I think he's done a great job of really trying to theme as many things as possible. Which so, is a great fundraiser. Oh, it was, it was I mean, a great fundraiser. You guys fundraiser. raise good money. Yep, yep. For the Children's Healing Center, they do a, they do a great job here in Grand Rapids, and they're looking to add uh, additional locations as well. So, yeah, they do a great job. Um, and really trying to think, uh, you know, really try to find things that, that are super close to things that we believe in here at Applied. And and kids and, and families and, and everything along those lines, those are, those are super important to us here. So, At what point in time did you say to yourself, you know what, I really do want to be a part of the family business and I think I'm ready for more responsibility. What was that tipping point for you? You know, even as far back as I can remember, I think probably I was 13 when I, this is all I ever wanted to do. Um, so I don't know if there's a ton of other people that want to, uh, again, we're a, we were a copier dealer kind of at heart, right. transitioning into, you know, more technology and things like that. So, um, you know, I think, again, as far back as I can remember, just being a part of the family business was important to me. I always looked up to my dad as a role model. And so that was always what I wanted to do, basically after I realized I wasn't going to be in the NBA. So, um, and that was pretty early on in life. So, uh, so yeah, I think, when I was selling uh, back from 2006 to 2008, um, again, another mentor of mine is our vice president of sales, John Kaninebelt. He uh, sits in the office right next to me, and uh, I think he kind of nudged me. So I'd sold for two years at Rico, sold for two more years here, two to three years here, and uh, he felt like we had somebody that left the business, and he felt like it was a good time for me to kind of step into sales management. So I did that for four years, and I would say he definitely nudged me and, and kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone. Um, but at some point kind of in my journey throughout the different roles that I had here, I realized that if at some point I was going to be the CEO or president, that I had to have all the experiences. So I kind of had to just own, own the fact that I was going to be uncomfortable in a certain role and, and figure it out. For our audience, we're going to take a quick break and thank our sponsors. When we come back, uh, we're going to dive a little bit more into the growth of applied innovation. 
and we'll see you after the break. Hey, if you are enjoying these great interviews, just take a moment and go to totalmichigan.com slash join. And you can get these episodes sent directly to your inbox because there's a lot more great stories coming. See you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan, where we interview ordinary Michiganders doing some pretty extraordinary things. I'm your host, Cliff Duvenois. Today, we're talking with Casey Lowry, president of Applied Innovation out of Grand Rapids. And Casey, before the break, we were talking a lot about... Uh, sales and the experience that's given you inside of the company. One of the things that I would like to talk about is uh, in, in some of the research that I was doing is this, I guess, eight year journey, so to speak, for you to become president of the company. What did that look like? What did that entail? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think even going back to the question you asked before the break, which was, you know, what are some of the things that my dad did to kind of help us grow? Um, one of the things that, and I don't know if it was his idea or somebody forced the idea upon him, but, uh, I really feel like he has thought about succession planning more than a lot of first gens typically do. Okay. Um, so yes, uh, what got into sales management, got, as we grew, I became a director of sales. Um, and then the, the plan was always to put me in as COO because the idea was never to transition the business to me individually. It was to transition to the leadership team. So it was all about building that team and making sure that we were prepared for sure. the future and giving us that experience. And a lot of that started back, so you had mentioned eight years. So yes, uh, it was about eight years ago that I would say I first started to attend our leadership meetings. And at first it was probably, you know, three years of me just listening and just trying to observe what the leadership team was working on and being aware of the ins and outs. And then slowly kind of over, over the course of those eight years really started to get more engaged. And then certainly, uh, so I've been president since October 1st and was COO for the three years prior to that. But certainly, uh, you know, he was, he had the foresight to be able to really try to help me get exposed to a lot of the different parts of the business. Certainly. And I know that exposure to the business and all these different elements, that's a part of it. But I'm also thinking, too, that there's the leadership part. There is the vision part, right? And this is, this is almost like another skill set that is required. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about thinking about just like take care of you know, one customer versus now taking care of a company. I've got employees. I've got payroll. I've got all these customers that we're taking care of. So talk to us about kind of like that, that shift in thinking. Um. You know, I would say that shift even happened probably eight years ago. My dad always encouraged me, said, hey, yes, this is your role, but you need to also be thinking about it from this hat and put this hat on from time to time. So I would say, you know, he's always- Now, what is this hat? So it's the hat of the owner, right? Okay. So, okay. Um, so he's kind of always encouraged me to, yes, that is your role right now. But think um, bigger. But think, yeah, but think bigger. And I'd say even- you know, going back for years, he's talked about uh, actively about, hey, every family has on average two and a half people in it. So you're responsible for, you know, at the time, maybe it was 250 people to put food on the plate for dinner. So it's just something that we, I would say, we've always talked about. Um, so doesn't, I mean, I still felt like, as I mentioned, as I stepped into different roles, maybe I wasn't prepared at the time, but I, I, feel like hearing it enough times over the years uh, hopefully prepared me to, um, you know, to be ready. And I think uh, uh, some advice that I got from a mentor of mine years ago was to just be the type of person that somebody would want to work for. Nice. And to me, that's kind of what it comes down to is just be a good person, create a great place to come to work every day, and the rest will kind of figure itself out. Part of that culture we were talking about earlier. Certainly, yeah. Yes, Definitely. One of the things that really surprised me when I'm doing my research and prepping for this particular interview, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. First off, billion-dollar brand. What surprised me in reading the press release for this, they sought you out. You did not go and, and bid on them. They actually came to you and said, hey, this is a problem. Can you help us solve it? Sweet Moses, that's awesome. Yeah, that was that was pretty good. Okay, so I'm I'm kind of fanboying right now. Yeah. <laughs> so talk to us talk to us about that. What was that like to have them just like call out of the blue one day, like, hey, can you help us? You know, we talked about being lucky and having good timing. Um, so what's funny is actually we saw a demographer at the Econ Club in downtown Grand Rapids, and that's actually the reason that we're in Tampa. So we knew that there was this deal. We had been contacted about a potential acquisition down in, in the Tampa area. And um, 
we kind of were, I would say, him and hawing about it. Saw a demographer. They were saying, you know, Michigan's staying fairly flat over the next 20 years. Now, what's a demographer? Uh, just that talked about demographics. Okay. So, okay. So he, you're just looking at populations and shifts in ages and, and all sorts of different things. So um, they were talking uh, about uh, Florida over the next 25 years was supposed to double in size. I think it was 21 Whoa. million to 42 million or something like that. Right. And so we thought, hey, let's let's try to see what we can do in a growth economy. Um, so we had that going on in the background and kind of tie it back into your Tampa Bay Bucks question. <laughs> uh, so we had been doing business with the Detroit Lions for a handful of years. We had a contact move down there and it was like, we love working with you, uh, at the Lions. I'm now at the Bucks. Do you know anybody down here who could help build a similar relationship? And we were just like, hold on. And within the next six months we were in Tampa and again, it kind of stars aligned and and uh, we were able to make that that deal, put that deal together. You know, th- this is just so awesome. And one of the questions that, that I have to ask, too, even as a small business owner, when you go up and you're going for somebody big, like I said, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, this is a billion-dollar brand. I, I sometimes have to ask this, like, wait, what, what made you think that you could actually get them as a client? Yeah, uh, and I guess— even going back, I've always kind of thought as applied as, you know, the, the, it was one of kind of our jokes forever as a little guy across town. So for me, it's always had a chip on our shoulder. We're always trying to punch above our weight. And nice. uh, so I think even with that, uh, you know, what all customers are looking for is partnership, right? And especially somebody like that, if we can, if we can potentially bring customers for them and they, and, and they can bring customers to us. And for us, it, it's, that's what we did with the lions and, and, I think that that's what they hoped that we would bring to the Bucks, and it both have been a great partnership. And uh, I'd say the other thing that all customers are looking for is just great service. They knew that they Indeed. could rely on us for that. And you know, uh, one of the things that we've talked about for years here is to not just fix the problem, but to fix the customer. So it's not about you know putting in a different part that fixes the issue and quit getting out of the office. It's about making sure the customer feels like the problem is solved. Right. And so that's something that we've always focused on. And that's why I feel like customers like Tampa would potentially, you know, seek us out. So when we talk about technology, what's the software? What's the hardware? What is it that applied innovation does for your customers? Sure. So I would say, you know, the backbone of what we've always done has been kind of the hardware piece. So that's been copiers, printers. Uh, Our joke was always, you know, IT folks are, are, you know, who pulled the short straw that has to deal with the copiers and printers. So for us, that's kind of the backbone, the bread and butter of what we do. Yeah. And we, what we want to do is try to make that something that they don't have to think about. So if they don't have to think about that, they can focus on other things that are more pressing. So, you know, that was kind of the core of our business. And that was till about 2001. And about 2001 was when we got into the automation space where we're taking paper-based process and trying to help people automate process. Um, I would say uh, probably about uh, 10 years ago is when we got into the traditional IT space, so the managed IT space, where we'll basically manage anything, so help desk to server to you know anything in the cloud. So we can help customers basically completely go third party with their IT, or if they want to do partial, we could help them with that as well. Um, and I would say for us too, so kind of that transition from applied imaging we were applied imaging until last July, I believe it was, when we officially became applied innovation. And for us, it was really that transition, right? It was, we're not an imaging company anymore. We've been in the IT space for almost 10 years, and uh, we're a lot more than that. And we kind of see ourselves as, um, as I mentioned, we, we want to build a great place to come to work every day. Passionate people take really good care of customers. We just happen to sell copiers and printers and now IT and now shredding. And now telephony and 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 for us, you know, I feel like again, if you can create an environment where people really take care of customers and really care, um, then it really doesn't matter what we sell. That just happens to be what we do. So if you go back to, uh, you know, Simon Sinek, start with why. This was around yeah. the same time when we, uh, you know, you're a book guy, so um, same time when we saw that TED talk was around the time when we started to kind of codify some of our culture. And uh, for us, it was a, a passion for service for people for business. So again, people first, um, because if we, we feel like if we're at service to one another, and if we're at service to one another here in the office, 
that's kind of where it starts. And then from there, you can go out and deliver great service to the customer. I love that. Because you talk about great customer service, 1,400 tickets a year closed, 98.9% customer retention. Yep. There's some happy people out there with you. There's some really happy people. Um, and feel again, I feel like uh, our, our customer loyalty center is a good example. If you go back probably 2012-ish, we looked at all the calls that were coming into Applied. They were primarily service or supply calls. So we cross-trained those two teams and made our customer loyalty center. And our goal was to really have every call come in and under three rings be able to pick it up and, and be able to take care of them right there. So again, it's all, all comes down to um, you know, how can we deliver service even just a little bit better? You know, one of the things my dad kind of always talked about was maybe we're never going to invent an iPhone, but if we can come up with a way to deliver service 1% better, um, but going back to the atomic habits, right? Can we yep. get 1% better every day? Yes. Then think about the gap that you'll have in between you and your competition over time. Now that you're president, what is kind of, what is kind of like the vision that you see down the road for applied innovation? So I think um, another mentor of mine always says is that a lot of companies that, you know, that, that are successful stop doing the things that got them where they are. So for me, my number one thing is to make sure that I stay true to the foundation that my dad's built. Um, it's things like employee breakfast or image palooza where we bring everybody together. And uh, that's something that, that we've themed for for years now, and that was the you know the nights, the medieval party that yes. we had with yep. the, with the customers or with all of our uh, with all of our employees over the summer. So, I think for me, it's kind of staying true to a lot of those roots, and um, but potentially expanding on that. So, uh, one thing that I'm passionate about is um, is trying to continue to to kind of cross sell across all the different functions of what we do. What we find oftentimes is that customers that find out that we are in the IT space are like, I didn't know that. Uh, you know, we would have definitely gone with you had we had the chance. So I think for us, it's about how do we continue to cross sell and make sure that customers are, are, have awareness of all the different things that we do and make sure that we're staying relevant for the next 35 years. Casey, if somebody's listening to this interview and they want to check out Applied Innovations, maybe read up on you, because I know you're all over the social, you're all over the place. Where can people find you? I would say the best place is probably AppliedInnovation.com. Certainly, you can check us out on, uh, on any social platform, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram, but uh, probably our website would be the best, best place to contact us. Awesome. Casey, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today. I really do appreciate it. Thanks, Cliff. I appreciate it. Awesome. And for our audience, you can always roll on over to TotalMichigan.com, click on Casey's interview, and get the links that he mentioned above. We'll see you next week when we talk to another Michigander doing some pretty extraordinary things. We'll see you then. 